And now, Move the Sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. What's up, everybody? Daniel Jeremiah joined by Bucky Brooks. This is Move the Sticks. Bucky, week four in the books. I, 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 you know, if we wanted to rebrand our show to kind of match the theme of the NFL, we could go from move the sticks to wide right. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. A lot of kickers having a tough time oh. knocking it through the uprights, and it's changing the way coaches are making decisions late in games. Oh, my gosh. Well, look, we, we, we're not going to spend too much time talking with kickers, although we are going to have Coach Billick on a little bit later in the show. We'll get a chance to ask him. I know it's a topic he, he enjoys talking about. <laughs> but what we do here on Move the Sticks, you're checking us out for the first time. Two former scouts. Uh, look at the football action on the weekend, kind of break it down from a scouting perspective, as well as look forward uh, to what's to come, matchups, different things we're looking forward to watching, breaking down players, what we thought of them when they came out of college, and, and where they are right now. That's what we do here on Move the Sticks. Yeah, we get a chance to dig into those old notebooks and see if we hit on some guys, if we miss, and just seeing where those young players can get better at how we can uh, point out to the fans how they can improve and how they will improve. And sometimes you think you've missed, and then you come to find out maybe you hit. And there's other times you think you've hit, and uh, maybe I missed. So we, we jump into it all here on Move the Sticks. we got a big episode coming up today. As I mentioned, Coach Brian Billick will join us as he does every week. And uh, TD, we got a bunch of other stuff uh, on the horizon. TD, behind the glass, our producer. Uh, give us a heads up on what else is coming up on today's show. What's going on, guys? A couple of young running backs making a mark in the lead. Todd Gurley had a big game yesterday. So did Devontae Freeman, second week in a row. So we'll break those guys down. We're also going to introduce you to the new elite cornerback in the NFL, Josh Norman, and his big plays down in Carolina. And lastly, what's the difference between being a head coach and difference and being a coordinator? Brian Billick is going to come on and talk about that. Chip Kelly, Bill O'Brien, Rex Ryan, all that fun stuff on today's show. Yeah, we, we've got a lot of topics to hit. And, and uh, Joe Feldman, the head coach of Miami Dolphins, has been let go. Heard a lot of rumors that that might be coming down the pike. We'll get to Coach Billick on that a little bit later on in the episode. So if you're a Dolphins fan, uh, stay tuned for that. But, but first off, Buck, this is a guy I know we've been looking forward to watching. You, we saw him a couple years ago, uh, dominated on the college football scene. Then he was suspended a little bit last year at Georgia. Then he gets hurt. And now we're finally getting to see him come off that injury. Todd Gurley for the St. Louis Rams, your first impression of what you've seen. He's everything that he was supposed to be. He's good as advertised coming into the league. You thought he would lose some of the stuff in terms of his speed, his physicality, his toughness. Coming off the energy where you think you would see a tentative player, not at all. This guy is a big-time player, a guy that brings all the skills that you look for at the position, and he's a workhorse. He's everything that I thought he would be at the National Football League, and I'm surprised that it really he, he was able to catch on so quickly and become that player. Now, I'm going back through my report. He ended up being my 12th overall player, and when I, when I look at my uh, report on him, I'll just read through it here real quick, and I know we have a couple bullet points we can throw up on the screen if you're watching this episode. But uh, outstanding size, runs hard, has breakaway speed. He's at his best on inside runs. He presses the hole. He finds a crease. He lowers his pad and explodes to the line of scrimmage. Uses a quick jump cut, uh, and, his, and when he gets upfield, he's dynamic. Does a great job keeping his feet alive on contact. Uh, repeatedly breaks tackles and carries defenders for extra outside runs. Has the burst to get to the edge. Piles up some long runs, Buck. Uh, catches the ball naturally. The area that I had concern needs to improve in pass protection. Miss a lot of cut blocks. He'll occasionally take, take a charge as well. Good in basketball, not good in football when you're taking a charge. Uh, if not for a season-ending injury, he would have been even higher on my list than number 12. And I, I thought we saw that guy we saw at Georgia. I thought we got to see him against the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, I was a big fan of Todd Gurley. Having followed him, he grew up in North Carolina. Obviously, I'm from North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina. He grew up in Tarboro. He was a high school sensation. Disappointed when he left to go to Georgia, but he continued to stack together solid seasons. And you could see that this was a guy that had a lot of talent. He could run inside and outside. And going back to his final season at Georgia, the thing that impressed me the most wasn't necessarily his ability to run inside, but when they put him back and let him run kickoffs and kickoff returns and show some of those different skills, catching the ball out the backfield, I likened him to Marshawn Lynch when he was in the draft, making a comparison in terms of Marshawn was a guy that could not only run, but he could catch. He's a guy that can stay on the field for all three downs. I believe that Ty Gurley has that potential, and I think we're beginning to see what he brings to the table for the St. Louis Rams. I had a chance to go see him in person against Clemson live, and it was like, okay, this is this is, this is is a dude. Right. I was around Jamal Lewis with the Baltimore Ravens. I saw a bigger version of Jamal, uh, and now we're seeing that guy emerge. Now, when we watched the tape from this last week uh, against the Arizona Cardinals, I thought it was fascinating how they did something we've talked about doing previously, and that's incorporating Tavon Austin to help this running game, and he's a perfect complement to what they're doing with 
Todd Gurley. You know, it's funny. When you look at the Rams and you go and try and find who their playmakers are, I think right now after looking at them against the Cardinals on Sunday, you would have to say Todd Gurley and Tavon Austin. And when you look at this team and, and put them in the mix, ghost motion is what you refer to as running a fake reverse, basically. That fake reverse action with Tavon Austin to the viewers can see them hold two, de two defenders from pursuing Todd Gurley on the front side. When you do it enough and occasionally give it to Tavon Austin, it has the ability to slow down the defense, allowing Todd Gurley to have more room. At the end of the game here against the Blitz, watch how they pause just enough to pay attention to Tavon Austin. That allows Ty Gurley to really get to the front side. Yeah, first of all, you have whoever's, if you're a man team, you have whoever's covering Tavon Austin is mirroring him in motion. But then not only do you have that defender taken out of the play, you freeze the eyes of everybody else. Even if you're the high safety, you, you don't know who has the ball. You just pause for just a second. And now you've got two guys. Now if you want to give it to Tavon Austin, yeah. you, you've paralyzed everybody a little bit. He could come out and then... If you want to give it to Todd Gurley, you've been able to hold that backside pursuit. So it's all on your front side defenders to stop the run. Yeah, it's a great, clever trick. It's a trick that really was popular in the late 90s, early in the 2000s. When I was in Oakland playing with John Gruden, John Gruden would routinely send Tim Brown around on a fake in around ghost motion to really help the running game. I'm glad to see it bring it back. And look, part of that is Frank Segnetti, their offensive coordinator, spent time in the college game. He understands how you use misdirection, those things to kind of risk – Divert the attention and the eyes from the defenders, just giving you a bell cow running back enough room. You know, one thing I, I was thinking about when we tied Todd Gurley together with Tavon Austin, this is a good lesson, I think, for anybody in personnel and, and coaching staff, whoever has the power or the juice on draft day. If you're going to draft a player, no matter who it is, you better have a detailed plan of yeah. how you're going to use that player. It's been so frustrating for me as somebody that I had, look, I like Tavon Austin. I saw what he could do in college. I thought he was just a nice a chess piece you could use in the yes. NFL all about matchups I thought he would be a very valuable piece and we've talked about before but maybe one a little bit higher than he should but I don't know that they had a game plan for him when, no. when they got him. now you see a new coordinator in place and now it's like okay that's the way they should be using Tavon Austin all along well now you have this one-two punch with Gurley and Tavon Austin I found it interesting that they had five plays of 20 yards or more Ty Gurley provided four of those plays Tavon Austin provided one of those plays if I'm the Rams now, I have something to build my offense around. Everyone else are auxiliary pieces, but I want to make sure that Gurley and Tavon Austin get a ton of touches because we saw how pro productive they were. And we also saw that Nick Foles played very, very efficiently and well because he didn't have all the pressure on his shoulders to carry the offense. No question. Real quick before we move on to Devontae Freeman, who I can't wait to talk about, but if you had to do it all over again, if you're Chip Kelly, you, you're going to give up Nick <laughs> Foles and a two – for Sam Bradford, you making that trade again? I don't think I'm making that trade. I don't think I'm making that trade if I'm Chip Kelly. Yeah, plus, plus a lot more change that you're A lot more change. You know, the, the, the thing about Sam Bradford, I was under the impression that Chip Kelly had a plan for how he wanted to use his skill set. Also, with Pat Shermer being there, who was the offense coordinator for the Rams when Bradford was a rookie, I thought they would do some things to play to his strengths. We're not seeing that. And so if I'm Chip Kelly, I absolutely would not do the deal because I think Nick Foles is playing better than anyone anticipated. All right, Bucky. Well, Devontae Freeman, we were both in the stands uh, watching the national championship game, Florida State against Auburn. And by the way, that backfield, not bad. Carlos Williams, who we've seen for the Buffalo Bills this year, as well as Devontae Freeman. But what did you see from Devontae Freeman in college at Florida State, and what have you seen so far in year two? You know, I'm really impressed with Devontae Freeman and his growth as a player. He's a guy that in college I thought was a guy that worked on the edges. Uh, he would be a nice change of pace, third down back, a guy that could play in spots but wouldn't be able to carry the whole load because I worried about his size. What I'm seeing as a pro is a guy that is a perfect fit in this zone-based offense that Kyle Shanahan has put together in Atlanta, meaning he can attack the inside but attack the outside. He has great vision, does a great job of finding those holes on the inside, but he also brings an added element being able to catch the ball out the backfield because he can give you production in so many different ways. He's a guy that's worthy of staying on the field, and we may not have known this had not – Tevin, Tevin Coleman gotten hurt early in the year. Yeah, Tevin Coleman's ribs might be feeling a little bit better uh, <laughs> after, after what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Uh, when I go back and look at my notes when I studied him in college, Buck, you know, power, he's, he's not a big guy, but he's got some power to him. He's shifty, and he's got really soft hands out of the backfield. Uh, I remember kind of comparing him to a little bit to Darren Sproles when Darren Sproles was coming out just because I think so many people on – on Darren, if they just were doing fly-by scouting, you didn't appreciate how strong he was, his ability to break tackles and pull through tackles. Uh, you see that with Devontae Freeman. I didn't think he had quite the quickness that Sproles had, but both guys very good out of the backfield catching the ball. I thought he'd be an outstanding third down back, maybe you know a, a 10 to 12 carry type guy. 
And now we've seen over a couple weeks in a row now, he's, he's even better than that. Yeah, he's even better than that. Being able to put the ball in the paint, being able to make these big plays and doing so much in this offense has really taken some of the pressure off Matt Ryan. And when you look at the Atlanta Falcons, because they're so balanced, they're able to run the ball, they're able to throw it downfield to Julio Jones. Matt Ryan's being very efficient. This offense is being able to protect a defense that is playing hard and with a lot of energy under Dan Quinn, which is why they're sitting at four and zero. Yeah, I think when you look at this organization, when they kind of fell apart, and and you know we had Mike Smith on the show a couple weeks ago, we didn't get too in depth on this, but I thought they kind of lost the, you know the strength of their team, became a little bit more of a finesse team, and I know Julio Jones in in the in the air has been phenomenal, but I think up front on both sides of the line of scrimmage. They're a more physical team, playing a lot better and opening things up when you really break down the tape and watch them. I think their offensive line's doing a really nice job. Done a great job of really creating a push up front. And even though it's done in a different way, they, they like to move guys laterally and, and find those ways for your running backs to attack vertically. They are being able to seal the edge. And this is an offensive line that we thought would struggle. It's interesting to see how they put it together, how Cal Shanahan has done a great job. Yeah, well, when you, when you break down the tape, though, Bucky, and you watch it, Devontae Freeman, you've got space because of the threat in the passing game, and you see him doing a nice job getting down blocks or getting pulls or getting up to the second level, and he's got a clear run through. He's got it, you, All you can ask for on a running play is to have a one-on-one -on -one opportunity at level two or level three, and they're getting it repeatedly. They are getting it repeatedly, and part of it is the scheme. We're seeing the shotgun running game. We're seeing the zone-based scheme. There you see them come backside kick out Jadavion Clowney. But what Devontae Freeman is doing, he's attacking downhill. Mm -hmm. In that offensive scheme, you tell your running back, I want decisive cuts, I want to eliminate the negative plays. He's doing that, and what they're doing, they're springing to the second level. And he has just enough creativity to take it a distance. I think people get a little bit confused on, on the zone scheme, Bucky, and they think of, okay, the linemen are all kind of moving together. They're going laterally. And I think people lose the fact that, no, they can still knock people off the ball when yes. you're doing that, but you're also getting the opportunity of a running back that presses the hole. You don't want a running back squaring up ladder. You want him to press the hole, put your foot in the ground, and go. Yeah, the, the rule is one cut and go. Mm -hmm. Make the decisive, make the decision right at the point of attack. And once you make a decision, it's about getting north-south and making sure you get positive yards. You want to eliminate the negative plays. Devontae Freeman is showing the ability to run downhill. He also brings that dimension in terms of catching the ball out of the backfield. But because he is a decisive north-south runner, you're seeing this Falcons running game really flourish. Yeah, they've done a nice job. Inside that division, I think probably two of the biggest surprises, you know, we talk about the Atlanta Falcons being undefeated. You have to go then talk about the Carolina Panthers. We mentioned last week Cam Newton, the most underappreciated guy in the NFL, in my opinion, the way, what he's done offensively. And then defensively, a guy that, look, at. Uh, we've said it. This is not a player that's playing like a Pro Bowl corner. This is a player that's playing like an All-Pro, and that's Josh Norman. I mean, he is playing at a high level. Now, he's really started playing at this level the last four or five games of last year heading into the year. We saw a guy that really made a huge jump in his development. Uh, when they put uh, Josh Norman and Ben A. Ben Wickery on their defense, you saw them start to make a lot of plays. Um, it's taken some time for him to play with the disciplined approach that they wanted down there. But now that he's playing within the confines of the defense, we're seeing the natural athleticism and talent take over. He's a guy that I liked a lot. I loved him when I saw him at the 2012 East West Shrine game. I thought as a big guy, he did a great job playing with his feet. And you were there. He jumped a ton of balls, got yep. his hands on his ball, was very active. Look, he was chatty on the practice <laughs> field. But I could appreciate that because he was so competitive. And he delivered when his number was called. And upon. for those that don't know how the All Star Game works, it's not like you know, it's not evenly distributed. The Senior Bowl gets the best players in the country for, for college, and then after they've had their pick, then the East West kind of fills in after that. So Josh Norman was at the East West. He went to Coastal Carolina as a small school. But my notes on him from the East West Game, Bucky, he was the clear star of the week. Picked off five balls in three practices. He's long, athletic, has very good burst, balance, and ball skills. He doesn't belong here. Basically, this guy has no business being at the East-West game. He was much better than that. You know, and talking to him at those practices back then, I, I was looking at my notes, and he told me what he learned that week was the ability to key the quarterback, to clue the quarterback, to read the three-step, to be able to sit off about eight yards off, and to be able to read the drop of the quarterback as it relates to the route that the receiver was running. And because of his ability to anticipate where the quarterback was going to throw, he was able to get his hands on a lot of balls. What we're seeing when we look at the tape his ability to play with his eyes on the quarterback and read and anticipate leads to a ton of big plays and interception opportunities. Here against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Look at him looking inside at the quarterback. He sees a quick outcoming, jumps it, takes it to the house. It's a common theme for Josh Norman, his ability to play with his eyes, to anticipate, to read routes, jump routes, does a great job of doing that. 
Yeah, you talked about being able to read the quarterback, read through the wide receiver to the quarterback. So if you if you put your foot in the ground, you're in underneath zone coverage, and you read three-step drop, and you see a back who's getting ready to come. I mean, you know, jump it all day long. His eyes are always on the quarterback, and that's led to a lot of his production. It's led to a ton of production for him. But not only is it the ability to jump to short routes, it's the ability to make big plays on deep routes here against the New Orleans Saints and Brandon Cooks on the outside. Watch him kind of shuffle and slide. He's still responsible for that deep third. Looking at the quarterback the entire time, still has the ability to get over top. Even though I'm a little nervous because Brandon Cook that behind him, it's understanding his athleticism, his leaping ability, and his ball skills. Some guys can break these plays up. He's coming down with interception, and that's a huge difference when you're looking at corners in the evaluation process. Yeah, the instincts are there and the awareness, and a lot of times, you, you okay, you can be susceptible to certain routes if you're going to turn your back to the wide receiver and play eyes inside. But what he's doing is he's waiting until he gets leverage with the with the wide receiver, and then he's reading quarterback. So now it's a point in time where I'm not playing my man anymore. I'm playing the ball up in the air. Yeah, and it's the ability to make plays at the break point. Not only can you get your hands on it, but can you come down with a critical turnover? This game is predicated on winning the turnover battle. So when you find a cornerback that can do that, it makes a difference. Once again, here against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, playing a little too deep zone. Look, trying to read the routes, but his eyes are inside of Jameis. Jameis, Winston gives away the indicator. He jumps the ball, makes the play, takes to the distance, puts another ball in the paint. His second pick six of the season, Josh Norman is giving them the playmaking that they need on the outside. And there's a premium for guys that can do that. And his second interception that he had against the Tampa Bay Bucks in that game, again, all, all he's doing, Bucky, is just sitting back, eyes on the quarterback. And it's funny because you watch him like, okay, he gets a little bit of separation from his man or who you would think would be he would be responsible for. Doesn't matter. His eyes are always back on the quarterback. And they, Jameis Winston's tipping his mail. You know, it, it, he's reading his mail, but also I would say some of that is in the preparation process in the film room, understanding route concepts, how things are tied together. I got the vertical route. That means the, the curl or the dig is coming. So now I can lean inside. He is beginning to take what he sees in the film room and put it in play on the field. He is becoming a very astute student. And now we begin to see the fruits of his hard work in the film room. Yeah, I still think I still think this. You guys know I love countdowns. Uh oh, what do you got? You know I love countdowns, so we got to do it. Top three cornerbacks right now in the NFL. Top three corners? I don't. I don't don't know if it necessarily changes, but but for me, yeah, go ahead. My three will continue to be Darrell Revis. I'll say Richard Sherman remains up there, and now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna amend my statement because the guy that's playing really well, Patrick Peterson, is playing better than he was last year. He deserves to be in that conversation as number three. What is Josh Norman? Is he five? Uh, he, he's, 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 he's getting in that conversation. I don't think he's still as good as Joe Hayden. I think he's in that conversation. Maybe you could say you can make the argument with Brett Grimes. But look, there are a lot of guys he has to overcome. Akeem Tlaib, Chris Harris. He's in the conversation as a top ten corner. I can't put him in the top five yet. I think I, I think I would put him up there in the top five, Buck. I, I think I, I still Revis the way he's played this year. He looks like he's found the fountain of youth the way he's moving around. Uh, Sherman to me, you know, I, the production's not his, as good as it is historically with him, but I still put him at number two. Gosh, and then I start getting into okay. I like Patrick Peterson. I just have been so scarred for what I saw last yeah. year from him. I'm, I might even sneak. I, I might even sneak how he's played this year. I might even sneak Josh Norman in at that because I saw Joe Hayden. I saw Amari Cooper eat his lunch as well. So there's a couple of these guys I've seen have some rough outings this year. And and, and the difference is, and and as we dig deeper into the evaluation process, remember in Carolina they're playing a lot of zone, yeah. whereas Joe Hayden is on that island naked all day long. No question. Well, that's the same thing to say support, about Richard not, Sherman. Not a lot of help. Josh Norman is protected a little bit because he's playing his own. They're asking him to look at the quarterback. They're giving up some of those completions underneath. He's making plays on the ball, which always catches your attention when you look at the tape. Yeah, well, you talked about those those Broncos corners being right up there with Aqib Tlaib and Chris Harris. And one of the things, nice play corner when you got a, a nasty pass rush like they have there in Denver. Absolutely. Right now, Buck, I mean, when, I, when I look at, at the what they're doing, I mean, they got after Teddy Bridgewater in that game. You know, when you have a dominant pass rush, it makes everything better. When I played in Oakland under Willie Shaw was a defense coordinator, he said the front end can always make the back end play better because their ability to affect the timing and rhythm of the quarterback allows the ball to fly out, errant tips and overthrows. It sets up a lot of opportunities for the players in the back. And so as good as that secondary is, and I think they're one of the best with Aqib Tlaib, Chris Harris, uh, TJ Ward, either Bradley Roby playing, that front four, and particularly the pass rush, Von Miller and Demarcus Ware, 
They are dominating. This group has 18 sacks. They're on pace for 72 sacks <laughs> in the National Football League season. I mean, the way they can press the pocket coming off the edge, they harass quarterbacks. You don't have a lot of time. And if you're playing from behind and you're forced to adopt that pass-only mentality, you're going to have a tough time dealing with the Orange Crush. Peyton Manning, to me, is still, you know, it does not look right. Uh, no, he doesn't. But I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, when I looked at this team, I didn't think that I picked the Chargers to win this division, partly because I thought, okay, Peyton Manning, this offense is going to come back. His skills have diminished a little bit. I'm not confident what they have with the offensive line. Questions with the running game. You lose your Pro Bowl tight end to Jacksonville. Julius Thomas is gone. But, man, I think the most underrated uh, acquisition in the offseason, Gary Kubiak's done a phenomenal job, but Wade Phillips as his defensive coordinator, what he's been able to do with this pass rush off the edge, you got corners, you got pass rushers, and you've got one of the more underrated linebacking cores led by Brandon Marshall, I think, in the NFL. I mean, this is a defense that really goes back to those days of the Orange Crush. When you go back to what they had back then with Tom Jackson and those other guys called Mecklenburg, they now have the ability to get after the passer without rushing five. They can come with four more. Von Miller, DeMarcus Ware, they roll in Shane Ray. They roll Shane in Ray got a sack Lee last Jackson. Week. I mean, they come after you in waves, and they wear you out by playing this deep rotation. They get after you. And, and when they do decide to dial it up, because they can play man-to-man -man on the outside, they can really knock your quarterback around. If you're going to go top three, they got a lot of playmakers on their team. If you're just going to go top three on Denver, you're going to rank them most important for what they're doing defensively. I, Wade Phillips might be number one, but I'm not going to let you use a coach. Uh, Player-wise, one, two, three, how would you rank them? I would go Von Miller first. I would go Aqib Talib second, and then DeMarcus Ware third. Von Miller, to me, is a guy that sets the table. His get-off, his quickness is something that I haven't seen since the late Derek Thomas was on the field. His ability to anticipate, to bend the burst, and get home. He's outstanding. Aqib Tlaib, his ability to play off and press. He can eliminate the number one receiver, takes the challenge, does a great job. But then DeMarcus Ware, someone that we thought was nearing the end and the twilight of his career, four and a half sacks yeah. this season. Has a sack in every game, continues to be a productive player, playing fewer snaps but more productive. I like what they're doing in Denver with yeah, And Wade Phillips has a history there with DeMarcus Ware. I'm going to go, how about this, Bucky? I'll go away from the Denver Broncos just in terms of a front, defensive front. I'll give you my top three with how they've played so far this season. I, and I put the Denver Broncos number one on my list, what they're doing, getting after the quarterback. Uh, I think they're a well-rounded defense, but I think up front they've been dominant. Number two, I know they've dropped a couple games, but still the Bills, you can't run the ball against no. them. They're very stout up front, and I think the sacks are going to continue to come as the season progresses. And then finally, I'll stay in that division. And ain't the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> it's the New York Jets. And this is without Sheldon Richardson, who's going to take them to a whole nother level. Leonard Williams is playing really well. Muhammad Wilkerson is playing at an elite level. Uh, they got after the Dolphins last week and got a coach fired. I mean, the New York Jets are really good, and they're going to be even better when Sheldon Richardson comes back. A high motor player that plays on the inside. They can do a lot. The guys in the back end, Antonio Cromartie, Darrell Revis, they're, they're, they're locking people down, creating turnovers. Todd Bowles is all about generating and producing takeaways. That front allows them to get there. But look, the Denver Broncos, the Buffalo Bills, all those guys can play great defense. The Broncos are playing at a high, high level right now. Oh, no. It's, it's going to be interesting to see if they can keep it up, Buck. But uh, it's that time, as it is every week. It's time for us to check in with our coach here on Move the Sticks, head coach Brian Billick. Follow that. All right, our coach is here, Coach Billick. And, uh, Coach, before I get to the football questions, I want to give you some love for your social media savvy because <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm just going to take a couple tweets from you during game day. Here, I'm going to fire them off here. This is, this is what you get when you fire at Coach, when you follow uh, at Coach Billick. Uh, here's one. Even Bradford's jersey doesn't fit right. He looks like a punter lined up at quarterback, which <laughs> I thought was a very astute observation. I agree. Uh, the next one, the Chiefs kicker is going to need an IV at halftime. Another very, very good observation. And then uh, finally here, which is going to lead into my first question, not that I wasn't appreciative before, but today is marking, making me even more thankful for Matt Stover's reliability. Coach, have you ever seen a weekend like this for kickers? No, and it's always a tough one because, and I appreciate you uh, giving the Twitter uh, sh uh, Twitter <laughs> shout out like that. I am having more fun. This is the first time I've ever been able to just sit on game day and watch all the games like a fan. It's been great fun. And you're right, watching these kickers, and, and you guys know how it is. I mean, they're a part of your team, and you want to give them love. But you also know 
man, you're out there sweating in training camp and in practice, and you look over there, and those guys are doing whatever it is they do and just kind of hanging out, and it's like, can, can, the, can you just do your job? <laughs> so I know you rally the troops around it and say, hey, when we don't lose a game on one play. But it does test you, and you, you alluded to Matt Stover. I had a great relationship with Matt, but it didn't start out that way, DJ. You remember, I had a tough time. I had never coached kickers before because kickers aren't football players. I would never coached a non-football player. And they, they're different, and they are. And I was trying to coach Matt when I first became a head coach, having never had any experience dealing with kickers, like a football player, and it didn't go well. And Matt had to coach me up as to how this was going to work, and I give him great credit for kind of getting us into a routine that was very workable. He was steady Eddie for us, and I knew exactly what his limitations were and what he liked and when I could call on him, short of the end of the game where, oh, hey, you just got to go make it. Hey, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, but during the course of the game, how to strategically use him, it's, uh, it's, it's just not as easy as you think. Stover looked at the game from a different lens. We had him come into the scouting room when, when you're at training camp, Coach, and talked to all the scouts about, you know, kicking and how to I mean, we don't know how to evaluate kickers again coaching them's hard evaluating them's hard so he came in there with a golf club and talked about how you know hey when you're kicking a 30 yarder you know hey i don't need to pull out my driver and he pulled out like you know it's a seven iron he goes now when you want a kicker it's a different swing he had all these golf clubs he's pulling out <laughs> equating the whole thing kickers are a different breed bucky absolutely a different breed coach and looking at the thursday night game pittsburgh and baltimore and Mike Tomlin having to kind of go through those mental exercises at the end of the fourth quarter. Your, your kickers missed two pretty much gimme field goals. And then you go into overtime. Talk about how early game misses can affect your decision making when it comes time to make a choice on whether to kick it or go for it on fourth and short. Well, it has to. And it's from the standpoint of, as I alluded to Matt Stover, Matt was great. I, I got into a real comfort zone because Matt would come to me at the beginning of every quarter and saying, here's where I'm confident from. Be the 30, 31, 32. If the wind were a certain way, if the wind, if it's in Pittsburgh, he may say, hey, coach, 25. You want me to kick it from the 30? I'll do it. But I'm telling you, I'll nail it. I got you covered if it's at the 25. Or he'd give me that number. So I could, as a coach now, put my team in a mode, and I'm sure Mike Tomlin, whether he had that relationship with Scobie or he goes, hey, pal, I've seen you before. Uh, it, we're getting in <laughs> overtime. And, and it's not just the decision on fourth down not to kick it. You have to make that decision going in, communicating to your coordinator, hey, look, if, if we're not here, if we're not to the 25, not to the 20, for Scobie, I'd say if we're not on the 10-yard line, I ain't <laughs> kicking this thing, okay? So that gives the coordinator uh, the, the concept of, okay, that's going to affect my third down call. You know, I'm on the 30, 32, 33, knowing we're not going to kick the field goal from there or the 41, as it were. Uh, I, I can make my third down call knowing I'm going to have to make a fourth down call. It's vital that you communicate that as the head coach so you don't all of a sudden, you go for a third down, you don't get it, and now you tell the coordinator, hey, we're going for it on fourth and two. You don't want to lay that on a guy. Yeah, that would be a nice piece of information to have earlier is what the coordinator <laughs> is going to tell your head coach at that point in time. Coach, we have our first firing of the year, four games in. Joe Philbin is out with the Miami Dolphins. Look, I know you, you know as, as well as anybody just how hard it is when you, you have somebody lose their job. There's families involved. It, it's a tough deal. But just from a football perspective, the timing of this, the decision uh, by the Dolphins, right move, wrong move. Well, First off, it depends on what's your objective. And you really have to ask yourself, okay, if we do this, what then? With all due respect to Dave Campbell, who it sounds like is going to be the interim, who was the tight end coach, I, I, I can't imagine Miami has the delusion that this is going to fire up the Miami Dolphins and they're going to go on a winning streak now. The last time an interim coach, a coach that stepped in after a firing, actually took his team to the playoffs was in 1961. Wow. So there's, there's no delusion. It was in Houston. There's no delusion about he all of a sudden, this is going to rally the troops uh, and we're, we're going to go on a winning streak here. Now, I will say this. They play Tennessee and Houston. Maybe they get a little juice going. Maybe they think they get a little energy. Obviously, they felt like Joe Philbin could no longer stand in front of this team and, and take ownership of it, and they were going to listen to him. I don't know if they're going to do it with Dave Campbell. Uh, there's the others that say, well, now this gives you 12 games to ramp up to make your hire. Uh, unfortunately, most teams bungle that. They don't do a good job of doing the, the groundwork leading into that. So, you know, if I were Miami, uh, what I would have done, any coach that can have the, the backing of the front office, whether it's real or not, 
I, I, if I were Mr. Ross, I'd have said, Joe Philbin's my coach, and he's not going anywhere at the end of the year. And then fired him at the end of the year. <laughs> at least, you know, hey, I, ch- I changed my mind. Yeah. But at least give him something. The players say, oh, hey, maybe we better respond to this guy because maybe he's not going anywhere. Right now, uh, and I don't know that the fan base and the players, this is just not a good place to be. Coach, if you do come in and say you're Dan Campbell, you're the interim coach, and now you're the new guy in charge, what are some of the first things that you do to get their attention and maybe try and right this ship, if at all possible? Well, you got to do something different. Let's remember now, he, he's been there, been there a long time. He's part of the problem. So all of a sudden, you just can't say, okay, my individual brilliance or you may like me. You got to change, even if it's a placebo. You got to change up practice. You got to change up the what the teaching sequence is. You got to change up the lifting routine. You got to change up game day procedure. You got to give them something, even though it may be, you know, uh, BS. Give them something. Oh, okay, we're going to be okay now. And maybe, just maybe, you get a little because they've got talent now. Maybe they're you know they're playing a struggling Tennessee team, a struggling Houston team. Maybe they make something happen. Maybe the players start to get this. Hey, maybe we got something going here. Uh, what's going to be interesting is now Campbell, who worked underneath Bill Lazor, who's the offensive coordinator, is now his boss. That's going to be a little bit interesting. The, the guy that Coyle, I, what I believed went down, and this is going to be interesting, is if I, and I know Joe Philbin, my guess is they said, hey, you got to get rid of Coyle, the defensive coordinator. we got to do something. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. It's not the problem. That's not going to be our answer. Uh, I, I'm not going to do that. Okay, you're gone. And I give him credit for backing his guy that way, but now, now he's gone, and now, now how do the players respond to Coyle? Whatever changes, is he going to change the defensive coordinator? Uh, he's got to do something, but obviously knowing that at the end of the day, it's not going to make a big difference. I think it's going to come down to whether the players, I don't know who, you know, it's not going to matter who's coaching. These players got to step up and start making some plays. But, Coach, uh, I was doing the, the uh, NFL Game Day Live show on Sunday, and uh, we get the press conferences as they come in live. And I, there were two that I, I want to play back for you and just get your thoughts on. And, and these are different personalities, and that's why I want to hit you on. Bill O'Brien and Rex Ryan, I want to let you listen to this sound, and I'll get your thoughts on it, Coach. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm disappointed in me as a head coach. That's what I'm disappointed in. Because I don't think I did a good job today, and I think I have to do a better job of being a head coach of this team. It starts with me. To, to go out there and perform like that, that's on the head coach. So I'm going to try to do a better job. Oh, you know, uh, I, I mean, that's, uh, that's one way of looking at it. I want to let you listen to Rex Ryan. This is, that's Bill O'Brien with the whole nothing is right in the world. And now another team that lost the Buffalo Bills, Rex Ryan. I want to let you listen to this one. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm proud of the way this team played. Now, can we play a lot smarter? Absolutely. But I'll take a team that will fight over a team that won't, that will sit back and take it any day of the week and bring on the next team. So that's how I look at it. Give me a team that's got some fight and will compete to the very end, right, wrong, or indifferent, no matter how good the officiating is or whatever. Makes no difference to me. I'll take a team with some competitive fight and some spirit. 17 penalties, ridiculous? Absolutely. 100% is ridiculous. And so you say what you want, but I'll, I'll take a team that'll fight. I'm proud of this team. And we'll keep fighting, and eventually we'll find a way to win. Eventually we'll find a way to eliminate penalties. So, Coach, you've got two different styles there when you go into a press conference. And, and one, of the, one of the questions I have for you is, is that predetermined when you go in there and say, this is the tone I'm going to strike? Because to me it seemed obvious that Bill O'Brien wanted to come in there and say, nothing is acceptable, and I'm going to take ownership and responsibility. And you had Rex come in there with the whole, well, it's not, hey, don't worry, we're going to be fine. It, you know, we're going to be just fine. It was kind of almost an uh, antagonistic approach to the press conference. Do you, do you strategize before you go to that podium? Well, you got to recognize now you're going to go through a stair-step sequence. First off, you begin with, and the Vogue thing in today's NFL, hey, it's me. It's all me. It's all my fault. Uh, whether it is or not, whether you believe that or not, you got to, okay, I'm going to cover the players. Maybe they'll rally around me because I'm going to take the hit for them. It's all my fault. You better be careful of that because Bob McNair, the owner, may look at that and go, you know what, I think, I think you're right. I think it is you. <laughs> Maybe I need to go the Joe Philbin route and make a change here. I understand the emotion of what they're doing. They're trying to take the hit for the player. It's almost become a little cliche. Really? You get your butt whipped the way we saw Houston get beat and it's just the coaching? Are you that messed up? I'd, I'd be careful with that one. And now let's remember, Rex pulled that one two weeks ago. 
with New England. So he's already played that card. Hey, it's me. I got to coach better. So now you got to move on to the next one. <laughs> and, and then what do you hear about coaches on a team that struggles? They're fighting to the end because what do you, what are the criticisms you're going to hear? Well, your team's quitting. They're not playing hard for you anymore. So you battle that. You hear coaches that are struggling all the time. Once they played the, hey, it's my fault. I got to coach better Trump card. Then they got to go to, hey, I love the way these guys fight. And they're fighting to the end because you don't want to get that moniker of, hey, the guys have given up for you. So it's you kind of go through that process. We also heard in Rex the veiled, hey, the officials killed us. Yeah. You know, he's not going to come out and say it. You know, I did, and it cost me $75,000. You know? <laughs> Rex learned well from seeing how much the league would hit me when I come out and going, hey, Johnny Greer screwed up, man. I don't. He's in there looking at that replay system, and I think he's looking at pictures of his grandkids <laughs> instead of looking at the play. And that one cost me $25,000. That was, uh, Coach, that was worth it, though. That, 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 that was, was that twenty five. dollars <laughs> it was. I, I, I gave that one with a smile. But, but so you're going to go through this sequence. Now the problem becomes, let's say, for Bill O'Brien, let's say they continue to not play well. Well, where do you go now? Now then you're going to have to burr up. And he'll, the next one, he'll burr up, and uh, we got to do this, and we got to play better, we got to play smarter. But, boy, my guys fought to the end. And so we'll continue to see that out of Bill O'Brien. At some point, you know, we're going to hear the, well, we got to get back to fundamentals. we got to get back to the, well – what if you're fundamentally wrong? You know yeah. what? And, and who let and who let this team get away from the fundamentals? So we'll we'll start to hear the series of these things as you're grasping almost at air to try to hold it together, short of, and then it eventually comes to that. Hey, my players suck. Okay, and and who's accountable for that? You know, coach, and think about trying to grasp at straws and trying to hold it together. In Philadelphia, we have a major problem. Chip Kelly's going all in. He made major changes in the offseason. And right now, they're sitting at one and three. And there's not a lot of confidence being displayed by team and the people around the team. If you're Chip Kelly, where do you go for answers? How do you turn this around in Philly? Well, there is no place to go because it's one-stop shopping. This is it. Uh, and it's not just play call. Anytime, and, and, and I know this firsthand, anytime – you know, you're vulnerable as a head coach, certainly. When you're a head coach calling plays, you're, you're multiply that tenfold because now, well, not only are you not performing as the head coach, but now we have serious questions about your ability to call a game or to orchestrate a game. It's a difficult double whammy. And he is, he is the end-all, be-all. He made all the orchestrated change in the front office in terms of the players. Uh, and we talked about this before. This thing's a, 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 a powder keg ready to blow up because as you guys know, you talk to the players, I've done their games, even when they're 10 and six, the last two years, the players aren't real fond of the way they do business in the way they practice. They feel like they're being treated like college players. Now, when you're winning 10 games, you're not going to rock the boat. But if this continues much like the players that have left, we're going to start hearing the chipping away from within with the players in terms of, and, and unfortunately it'll be under the anonymous uh, tag to begin with, but some of the things, whether it be the way they don't get a day off, whether it's the way they practice structure, how they eat, the way they're, they're micromanaged, uh, uh, the way Chip Kelly does it, this was going to be the new wave. So this starts to begin to unravel, and Chip Kelly, um, it is a tr it's, it's a it's a transition coaching the pro player. It's why a lot of coaches don't make that transition. doesn't mean they're not good coaches, but whether it's a Steve Spurrier, whether it's a Nick Saban, whether it's a Bobby Petrino, they find out that dealing with the pro player is a different mentality, and it's going to test Chip Kelly. Coach, talk about Chip Kelly, you know, wearing both hats with the, the head coach as well as the general manager. But I want to take, you know, with the last question here, take you all the way back to what we talked about with, with Coach Philbin and that firing and the challenge that, that guys have going just from coordinator to head coach. It's a phrase we hear so often, right? We, we've seen, look at the job that Rod Marinelli's done as a defensive coordinator this year for the Dallas Cowboys. We know it didn't end up well as a head coach of the Detroit Lions. Wade Phillips, you know, varying degree of success as a head coach. Now he's got the Broncos playing unbelievable back as a coordinator. What, what is the main difference from making a guy a good coordinator to then transitioning and then becoming a good head coach? Well, it's the same thing from the position to the coordinator. You know, Bill Walsh used to say, and, he, and only in the eloquent way Bill Walsh could put it. He said, going through the progressions of coach, of, of levels in coaching, it's like admiring a, a work of art. That when you're a position coach, you're right there. You're in the middle of it. And you can appreciate the, the finer strokes, the texture of the materials. When you become a coordinator, you have to step back a little bit. You have to have a little bit bigger perspective. 
Now, you miss some of that close down in the, in, in the, in the weed, so to speak, mentality. You lose a little touch with the texture, but you have to to have the bigger perspective. Now you've been a head coach. And as much as you want to be there, you have to have that much bigger picture. And I think we're seeing now uh, it is a tough transition, particularly for those guys that are used to calling plays. That's how you made your name. Your name. It's hard to recognize that now when you become a head coach, how about this? When you're a coordinator, you guys know this, it's 24-7. You can't think. I mean, you are wholly consumed 365, 24 hours a day about the structure, the play calling, whatever. Then you get a head job and you decide, oh, I can do that and this job. (laughs) And you make that mistake. You look at the best coaches we have in the league right now. They're the ones that are truly the head coach. Now, they got there by being a coordinator. Look what's going on in Green Bay where Mike McCarthy, who I'm sure he hated to give up the play calling duty, but he knew that team needed more of the head coach, that broader view than a guy that was mired in the play calling as he was as a brilliant play caller. But he knew Tom Clements and and Aaron Rodgers would do a good job with it. I advocated last week in my piece, Sean Payton ought to look at that. You know, uh, uh, his coordinator and Drew Brees did a great job when he wasn't there. They threw for 5,000 yards, 43 touchdowns. Pete McCauley, they'll be fine. What New uh, New Orleans may be needed in this transition is for him to step back and and have that broader view as the head coach to orchestrate those things that you have to do. And that's a tough transition for someone that thinks of themselves a certain way, is used to calling plays. And quite frankly, it's fun. You hate Mm. to give it up, but you have to learn to kind of separate yourself with that longer view, that bigger view as the head coach. Uh, that's fascinating stuff, Coach. Look, you bring it each and every Monday with us. I teased what you do on social media. That's at Coach Billick on Twitter, which you guys need to check out. But also your triple threat, Coach, because you're also writing on NFL.com. And uh, Wednesday, uh, I wrote about how you're not a big fan of instant replay, which is which is something people need to check out. And then coming up Friday, you're going to talk about your top five Coach of the Year candidates. Coach, you got you're working too hard, man. You got to you got to. That's you gotta, all right. Hey. It's lots of fun. I've never been accused of not having enough BS. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you saving us some once a week every Monday, Coach. Thanks for stopping by again. I enjoy it, guys. All right, that's, uh, that's Brian Billick each and every week. Always fun to catch up with him, Bucky. Fun show today. Absolutely fun. Did a lot of stuff. Broke down some X's and O's. Hey, Coach. Provide some insight on the coaching profession. I, I really learned a lot. Yeah, we're going to be back again next or later on this week. We will be back with another episode on Wednesday, as well as we'll pump out a bunch of those little short videos we do, some XO breakdowns. Uh, we'll have plenty of content for you. You can check out. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes uh, as well as YouTube. And uh, check us out, NFL.com slash podcast. You can check us out there. We're, we're, we're basically everywhere. Everywhere. TD's, everywhere. TD's running the show behind the glass. Uh, No Sully this week. I thought this show might collapse, but we did survive. Uh, We will be back again this week coming up. TD's pumping his fist back there because we didn't go under without Sully. I had my doubts, TD. (laughs) We're here, guys. We're still here. All right. We're just making sure. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us today on Move the Sticks. Bucky, once again, thank you for being my partner and uh, coming in here. Taking care of business twice a week. One down, one to go here on Move the Sticks. the Sticks with Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. For more, go to nfl.com slash podcasts.